Tonight I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the work that I've been doing as well as many of my colleagues in terms of trying to figure out where water might actually be on Mars. And the reason that we're so interested in this is that it's basically what NASA uses to explain why we need to be going to Mars so much. Uh, the reason for this is that there's several different aspects of Mars that we're very, very interested in. Uh, of course, the big thing is whether or not life has ever existed on Mars. Is it there today? And we know, at least for here on Earth, you do need to have water in order for life to actually survive. So that's one of the big challenges of trying to figure out where water might be and whether or not there might actually be life on Mars. Uh, we're also very interested in the climate, both the current climate as well as ancient climate. And by the end of this evening, I will we'll have told you about how we think that Mars has actually undergone quite a bit of climate change over time. How we think that at one time it may have been very Earth-like and with lots of water on the surface, but that we don't actually have today. And then we also have a little bit of the geologic history of the planet tied in with the role of water. And then finally, of course, we want to go to Mars. <laughs> uh, have had a lot of interest in going to Mars. It's not just here in the U.S. It's countries all over the world that want to go. So if we don't go, Russia and Europe and India and China are all interested in going in our place. So, uh, But if we're going to go and explore Mars, obviously we don't want to have to bring all the water with us from Earth out to there. So we need to know where it is there today. But at first glance, you would look at this and say, why are we even trying to bother identifying where water might be on Mars? Because, you know, under the current climatic conditions, it really can't be there. Uh, first off, Mars does have an atmosphere. It's a very thin atmosphere composed primarily of carbon dioxide. But as I said, it's very thin. And the way that we can actually kind of get a sense of how thin an atmosphere is, is by looking at the atmospheric pressure on the surface. So right now, as you are sitting here, Earth's gravity is pulling our atmosphere down on the top of your head. And our atmosphere is putting a force on the top of your head. If you take that force and you divide it by the surface area of your head, that force divided by area is what we call pressure. And so while you're sitting here right now at sea level, the atmosphere of the Earth is pushing down on the top of your head with a pressure of what we call one bar. And so um, it turns out that in the case of Mars, if you go to the surface of Mars, the atmospheric pressure is about 1 100th that. So it's a very, very thin atmosphere, not a whole lot of atmosphere above you to actually be pulled down on the top of your head. To give you another sense of how little atmosphere this is, here on Earth, if you wanted to go to an area where you have about 1 100th the atmospheric pressure at sea level, you have to go about 100,000 feet up into the atmosphere. I mean, I flew in today and they said, oh, we're cruising a 34,000 foot elevation, you know. It's like, okay, I had to go like three times higher in order to get to what the surface pressure is on Mars. But what this means is that if you go ahead and put liquid water on the surface of Mars today, there's not enough atmosphere to hold it in the liquid form. It immediately will boil away up into the atmosphere and become water vapor. So Part of the reason we don't have liquid water on the surface of Mars today is because of this very thin atmosphere, not enough atmospheric pressure. In addition, Mars is about one and a half times as far from the sun as the Earth is, so it's a lot colder there as well. Average temperature is about minus 82 degrees Fahrenheit. And so, of course, if you have liquid water, put that into that temperature, what's going to happen to it? <laughs> going to turn to ice, right? So liquid water on Mars can't exist. If you put liquid water there, it either goes into vapor into the atmosphere or it turns into ice on the surface. And so we can actually see this. When we go ahead and we look at Mars, we do see that there are white clouds in the atmosphere. Uh, here's a really nice image of a storm system up near the North Polar Cap. You can kind of zero in on it right there. And that actually is water ice clouds that we're looking at. And it probably actually produced some snow up there. But again, no liquid water in the meantime. Uh, but the temperatures are, again, cold enough, and the atmosphere is actually got a lot of water vapor in it, such that in the early morning hours, that water vapor can actually condense out in the form of clouds. And so in the early morning hours, right after the sun rises, a lot of times we can actually see fog in the low-lying areas of the planet. And again, those are water ice crystals that we're actually looking at there. And then we do have a lot of water ice clouds in the atmosphere, as I mentioned, and I absolutely love this picture. 
because it was actually taken by a spacecraft that we had on the surface of the planet. Back in 1996, we had the Mars Pathfinder mission that landed on the surface. And uh, one morning, NASA sent a signal and said, wake up early. We want you to take a picture of the morning star out there, which is Earth. And so the rover woke up, and it took this picture, and guess what? It got clouded out. <laughs> I love that because that's always been my problem whenever I've tried to do ground-based observing. I always get clouded out. That's why I went and turned to spacecraft image analysis instead. Um, <laughs> but anyway, yes, there's a lot of water vapor in the atmosphere. And we also do have some water ice that we can see very easily. Uh, the, this is actually a series of three images that were taken by the Hubble Space Telescope in orbit around the Earth. And they've been put together in kind of a mosaic. We took a picture, another picture, another picture, and then pulled them together to actually give us a picture of what it would look like looking straight down on the North Polar region. So that's why there's some areas here where we don't have any images. But it turns out at the height of winter, we have a really big polar cap that extends down to about, oh, 60 degrees latitude in, the, in that hemisphere. And as time goes on, it starts to shrink. Now, the issue is that at the height of winter, this polar cap that you're looking at here is actually carbon dioxide ice. It is cold enough that part of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of Mars actually condenses down on the surface and creates an ice cap. And that ice cap starts to go ahead and shrink over time. So at the height of spring, it looks something like this. And then at the height of summer, we have this really small polar cap remaining. And it turns out that the temperature at the North Polar region at the height of summer is too warm for carbon dioxide ice. But it turns out it's just right for water ice. So we actually have suspected since about the 1970s that this is actually a water ice cap at the North Polar region. And we now actually have orbiting spacecraft that are able to look at the composition of materials on the surface. And they have told us that, yes, it turns out this is actually water ice. So we do have water ice on the surface of the planet. We have water vapor in the atmosphere. And, but when you go ahead and you add up you know, how much water we have in those two reservoirs, it's not very much. And we actually think there should be a lot more water that actually has existed at Mars. Part of this is because Mars lies between Earth, which we know is water rich, and the outer solar system, where pretty much all the moons are water ice. So we would expect, just by its position in the solar system, that Mars should actually have quite a bit of water there. But a better argument actually comes from our spacecraft missions. And as I mentioned, we have instruments on board several of these missions that can tell us about the surface composition. And what we have found is that there are a lot of areas, oops, excuse me, uh, a lot of areas here highlighted in blue, for example, that are actually exposing hydrated minerals. And these are minerals that actually formed in the presence of liquid water. Wow, <laughs> we don't have liquid water there today, but we see evidence, especially in the ancient areas of Mars, that there was a lot of liquid water there in the past to create these hydrated minerals. This image down here is actually the location where one of our rovers right now, the Opportunity rover, is actually busy exploring this area. It's uh, the rim of an ancient impact crater. And it turns out that rim does actually expose some hydrated minerals shown in the greens and the reds here in this, in this picture. So we're getting an idea that, yes, there actually was a lot of liquid water on the surface of Mars early in Martian history, but it's not there today. We also see a lot of evidence from the geology. I mean, we see features here that, hey, those are channels. They had to have formed by some sort of fluid. And when we look to see what kind of fluid would be the most likely that we would have at Mars, it does turn out to be liquid water, even though the atmosphere can't support it today. And a lot of times, these channels will come along and they'll cut the rim of an impact crater. And then we look at the floor of this crater, and it's nice and smooth. Where these channels actually cut into the, into the rim of the crater, right at this area, we actually see features like this. Does that look familiar to anybody? That's a delta. It's just like the Mississippi Delta where New Orleans is. But this is a delta on Mars. And we see these in several different locations. <laughs> 
Also, when we start looking at these smooth deposits on the floor, they're not necessarily smooth all the way. Uh, some areas are kind of eroded back, and in those cases, we actually see very fine layers. Looks like sedimentary deposits that were actually created. And so what we propose is that there actually was liquid water flowing through this channel at one time. It got into the floor of this crater. It created a pond. And the sediments from that water actually got deposited onto the floor. Eventually, the water vaporized up into space, but it left behind this evidence that there was actually liquid water in this crater at one time in the past. And then we also have evidence from Martian meteorites. Turns out that although we have not actually been able to bring back samples just yet of the Martian surface with our spacecraft missions, Mother Nature has delivered samples to us as it is. Uh, and that's in the form of Martian meteorites. So these are rocks that got blasted off the surface of Mars millions to billions of years ago by impact events. And it turns out some of them, when you start looking deep inside of them, actually contain globules of carbonates. And carbonates are a mineral that basically forms when you've got liquid water and carbon dioxide interacting together, and they precipitate out to give you carbonate. And so the fact that we actually see carbonates within these meteorites tells us that, hmm, okay, there must have actually been liquid water interacting with that carbon dioxide rich atmosphere sometime in the past. Now, at this point, usually somebody raises their hand and goes, how do we know those guys are from Mars? And that's a good question. They're not stamped made on Mars. We'd probably be suspicious if they were. Um, <laughs> but it turns out there's lots of uh, kind of um, inferential evidence that suggests these guys are from Mars. First off, they're volcanic material, so they had to come from a volcanically active body. They're also relatively young as meteorites go. They're on the order of about 180 to 1.3 180 million years to 1.3 billion years. So you had to have a body that was volcanically active as recently as 180 million years ago. And that kind of rules out most bodies in the solar system. It rules out asteroids, things of that nature. So we kind of were left with, okay, it could be Venus, could be Earth, could be Mars. Turns out that there's oxygen that's trapped within these meteorites but it's not in the ratios of oxygen isotopes that we have here on the Earth, so we can rule out the Earth. And trying to get rocks off of Venus, which is about the same size as the Earth, kind of tough. Uh, Mars is about a third the size of the Earth, or half the size of the Earth, so it's easier to get rocks off of there. Plus, if you knock a rock off of Venus, it's gonna go inward towards the sun with the big gravity. Mars, it will come inward, but Earth is in the way. So uh, we kind of suspected these guys were from Mars. And then in the 1980s, uh, scientists at Johnson Space Center in Houston actually discovered that there's glass within some of these meteorites. And in that glass is actually trapped traces of an atmosphere. And it turns out that atmosphere is exactly the same composition as the Martian atmosphere. So that was really the clincher that, yes, these guys are from Mars. So again, these guys are telling us that, uh, hey, we're from Mars, and we're containing carbonates that came from Mars, and therefore, you know, another good line of evidence that we actually did have liquid water on Mars in the past. So back in 2004, we decided to send two robotic geologists to the surface of Mars to actually check this out. And these were two rovers, uh, originally called the Mars Exploration Rover A and Mars Exploration Rover B. We decided those were too boring of names, so we actually had a big nationwide competition to name these two rovers. And the winning entry actually came from a young girl in Phoenix who had been adopted from Russia. And she said, when I lived in the orphanage back in Russia, I looked to America as the land of spirit and opportunity. And so these two rovers became known as Spirit and Opportunity. And they both landed on the surface of Mars in January of 2004. They were designed to last for 90 days. Opportunity is still going. <laughs> it is our little Energizer bunny. It refuses to give up. But the whole purpose of these missions was to test all of these ideas that we had that, yes, it looks like there was liquid water on the surface of Mars, at least early in its history, and it's all this circumstantial evidence we have from geology and Martian meteorites and so forth. Now let's actually send missions out there to test the rocks close up and actually look for evidence of water. <laughs> 
And so they carried a whole suite of instruments to go ahead and actually, you know, go looking for this water. So this is the landing site for Spirit, which landed on January 4th, 2004. Uh, this is actually a topography map that you're looking at, which is why it's all colorized. Uh, but basically, this is uh, blue is low and white is high. And uh, I was actually involved. We, we had a big community input to the actual landing site selection for these missions. And I was involved with the team that actually proposed this particular landing site. Uh, now, when people think about us going to Mars and landing on Mars, a lot of people kind of think, oh, we just put a map of Mars up on the wall and we throw a dart and that's where we go. <laughs> but it turns out it's much more involved than that. Uh, you know, certainly there's a science that's driving all of it. But then the engineers get involved. And they're the real killjoys, you know, because we want to go explore these really exciting places. And the engineers go, that's too dangerous. Our mission's going to crash. We're not going to be able to get any data back. So they're the ones who are telling us, well, you've got to go someplace that's low so the atmosphere is thick enough and uh, we can slow things down with a parachute. And, oh, by the way, it's got to be really smooth because we don't like rocky stuff. And, of course, the geologists want to go and explore rocks. So, you know, there's this constant back and forth between the scientists and engineers. But this is one of those locations where we see a channel coming in and cutting the rim of this ancient impact crater. And the floor is really smooth. And so we argued, OK, this looks like it was an ancient lake bed. And it's low because it's inside a crater. And it's smooth because it's an old lake bed. <laughs> and so the engineer said, well, OK, you can go there. <laughs> and this is the view from Spirit after it landed. So right after it landed, it looked out. And yeah, it's nice and flat, kind of what you expect uh, you know, an ancient lake bed kind of look like. It's all red because there's a lot of red dust on Mars, so it coats everything. Uh, but in the distance here, a few miles away, you can actually see this little range of hills. And that range of hills became known as Columbia Hills because we lost the Columbia Space Shuttle and the astronauts right about this time. So uh, keep that in mind. That it's a few miles away from the landing site, but it, end, it turns out that that's where Spirit ended up by the end of its mission. Uh, Opportunity landed about two weeks after Spirit. It landed on the other side of the planet from Spirit because there again the engineer said, well, they're going to be communicating with orbiting spacecraft and you can't have them in the same area, otherwise they'll be talking to this you know, spacecraft at the same time and we can't have that. So this is in another area of the planet. But it turns out that this area was selected because the information from orbiting spacecraft indicated that there is a huge deposit of hematite in this area. Hematite is an iron oxide. Here on Earth, it forms in the presence of liquid water. So we basically selected the spirit landing site in a place called Gusev Crater because it looked like from the geology that it was an ancient lake bed. We selected Opportunity's landing site in Meridiani Planum because of the chemical evidence suggesting that there had been liquid water there. And this was our view from the landing site at Opportunity. And as soon as this picture came down, we all started jumping up and down going, cool, rocks. <laughs> OK, we're a bunch of nerdy geologists. We like our rocks. Uh, but it turns out the reason we got so excited about these rocks is that these rocks are actually f where they formed. Every place else we had ever landed on Mars, rocks had been brought in by other processes either by impact or by fluvial processes or what have you, they had not actually formed in that area. They were brought in from elsewhere. And this, it turned out, we landed inside a very small crater. And these are rocks exposed in the wall of that crater. So here we can say these rocks formed here. And if we can go and actually analyze those rocks and find out what in geologic environment was um, you know, present at the time that they formed, that will tell us you know, what was going on in this area. So uh, Spirit lasted for quite a while. And uh, it went ahead, roved around, and started analyzing all these nice flat deposits that we thought were lake bed sediments. And it turned out they were all volcanic. OK, yeah, there's a little volcano off to the side that we looked at and kind of went, yeah, maybe there's something from that. But nah, it looked too promising to be an old lake bed. So we were kind of disappointed with that. And, and this slide here just kind of shows where the color points are, some of the rocks that we analyzed. And this is kind of a typical diagram that geologists use to figure out what kind of volcanic rocks we got. And yeah, they're definitely volcanic. 
So what we decided to do is head off to the hills, go off to Columbia Hills, and see if maybe they were sticking up above the volcanic lava flow and could actually give us evidence of the ancient lake bed environment. And so that's what happened. Spirit went up to Columbia Hills, and lo and behold, it started finding minerals that indicated, yes, they did form in the presence of liquid water, things like guttite and hematite and so forth. And so we got a little more excited at that point. But probably the most exciting thing that happened with Spirit is that uh, it's a rover with six wheels, and the front wheel actually quit working. And so what we ended up doing was driving Spirit backwards most of the way, and it would drag this front wheel along. And as it did so, that wheel would actually sink down into the soil here. And when we looked back, we started seeing, hey, there's a lot of white stuff that's actually exposed you know, by this dragging wheel. And when we analyze that composition of that, salty, of that you know, white material, it turned out that it actually was salt. And so again, salt is something that you actually expect in an old lake bed. I mean, in Arizona where I live, yeah, we've got lots of dry lake beds, and they're usually coated in this white stuff that's very salt rich. And so we looked at this and we said, yeah, you know, this is more consistent with our idea that this um, would actually be an ancient lake bed. The downside is that this sandy stuff that we were able to drag the wheel through and you know, show all this great salt uh, also was what led to Spirit's demise. Turned out Spirit got stuck in the sand one time and uh, we couldn't get it out. Now the Gustav Crater landing site is far enough south and it turns out Spirit is powered by solar panels. And so at the height of winter, what we would do is we would find a nice slope that we, uh, you know, a hillside that we could park on and point the solar panels towards the sun to keep it alive during the winter. Well, now we're stuck in a sand dune. Can't move it. And so that winter, spirit actually died. It did not get enough energy. We've tried several times since then to reestablish contact, and no, we just never have. So uh, it's, the spirit mission ended in March of 2010. But again, the rock compositions and the salty exposures really do indicate that, yes, at Columbia Hills at least, uh, we have good evidence that, yeah, this actually was a lake bed with just the rest of the craters covered with the lava flow. Uh, and in fact, one of these white streaks that we exposed uh, ended up having about a composition with 90% silica. Silica is silicon and oxygen. And in Earth, the only way to get such high concentrations of silica is actually in hot springs. And so there is speculation that the center of this crater not only was water rich, but there was still some heat left over from the impact and actually caused some hot spring activity to occur there. And again, we also found a lot of carbonates in the rocks here. So again, yeah, you know, it does look like eventually we did find our evidence of ancient water here on Mars. Uh, ancient, how ancient are we talking about? Eh, probably about 3 to 3.4 billion years old, quite a while back. Um, opportunity landed in that little crater. We went over and explored those rocks that we've been so excited about, and immediately we could see those rocks are actually layered. And there are two ways that you can get layered rocks, either in a water-rich environment or a desert environment. And so when we started analyzing the composition, we started to find that, hmm, they're very, very salt rich here. And this is two different types of analyses. The blue line, or the red line, is actually the surface of the rock. But there's a lot of dust coating on these rocks. And so we actually had a little grinding tool that we could grind away the surface dust and expose the inside of the rock. And the blue lines actually show that. And what we found is that the salt content went up as we went into the rock. So it wasn't just some superficial deposit. This was actually rocks that formed in a salt-rich environment. And when we took a closer look at these rocks, a lot of times we saw these little depressions within the rocks. This is what we call a microscopic imager, um, image, and uh, basically it's a magnifying glass. But uh, <laughs> these little depressions that we see in the rocks are actually quite common here on the Earth. They're called vugs. And what happens is that when you form a rock in a salt-rich environment, you get a salt crystal that actually forms in there. And then over time, water or just erosion in general causes the salt to dissolve or drop out, and you're left with a little cast of where that salt crystal was. And the rocks are just full of these things at the Opportunity Landing Site. 
So we're starting to look at this and say, hmm, looks like maybe these rocks formed in a salt-rich environment. And then, remember, we chose the Opportunity Landing Site because of the hematite signature, the iron oxide. And when we looked in the rocks, we started seeing all these little round things. Uh, they actually start nicknaming the, you know, saying that these look like blueberries in a muffin, and so they got to the, the name of blueberries. But it turns out these are where the hematite signature comes from. These are what we refer to as concretions. And again, they're common here on the earth. Uh, there's a really good exposure of them just north of where I live, up on the Colorado Plateau. And what happens is that as water percolates through like sandstone, it'll actually pick up iron. And when it gets out to the edge, the water starts to evaporate and it leaves this iron oxide behind. And it will form these little round spheres within the rocks. And so again, the evidence of the salt-rich material, the uh, hematite concretions, and then when we looked at the you know, layering within the rocks, a lot of times it was kind of curved, which is indicative of ripples. And so all of this came together and we went, you know, these rocks formed in a saltwater sea. And, you know, it had to have been around for some period of time for these rocks to actually have formed in this way. Uh, Opportunity is now, has now been out exploring lots of other craters. The reason we like craters is, I like to refer to craters as nature's drills because, hey, nature has provided us with a depression. And of course, we know from here on the Earth that if you want to look further back in time, you look further down, right? So turns out that craters, the depth of the crater, of the depth of excavation of the crater is proportional to its size. So the bigger craters we can go to, the further down they've actually excavated, the further back in time they've actually exposed. And so we have gone ahead and explored several other craters uh, that were bigger than the one that we landed in. And uh, what we have found is that this area went back and forth between being very wet and very dry. So we see evidence that there was a, a sea there at one time, and then it turned into a desert. And then it went back to being water rich, and then it went back to being a desert. And we can actually read that in these different layers of the rocks that we see within these craters. And so what we actually have found is that this saltwater sea existed in this area, not for tens of years, not for hundreds of years, but probably thousands, if not millions of years. So it actually was a very long-lived, water-rich environment that we're looking at. Now again, we're looking back at probably about three and a half billion years ago, though. You know, it's not something that's been real recent, but it does tell us that early Mars must have actually been very warm and very wet. And therefore, we must have had a different climate than what we have today, where we can't have the liquid water on the surface. Uh, we also have another rover on Mars right now, the Mars Science Laboratory, also known as Curiosity. Uh, it landed back in 2012, and again, we ended up going into a crater. It's a very large crater called Gale Crater. Land the landing site was about right up there. And the reason we chose this particular landing site for Curiosity, which is really looking for evidence of ancient water again, is this big mound in the very center of this crater. Turns out that this mound, the very bottom of it, actually has minerals indicative of hydrated minerals. So again, we think the bottom part of the mound may have actually been in place in a, a lake bed environment. The upper parts of the mounds, though, are actually very dry. They may have been in place by volcanic ash or something of that nature. And so what we're aiming to do is to actually move up this mound. We've got a rover, and we're trying to find a path up through this mound so that we can actually see how Mars' climate has changed over time from a very water-rich environment to the much colder and drier conditions that we have today. Um, but Curiosity's been busy exploring the area since it landed, and uh, it turns out that we did land near an alluvial fan, which forms anytime you got water coming along carrying sediment, hits a slope, and all that water spreads out, and you get the nice kind of fan-shaped deposit at the base of this cliff. So we did find evidence of um, you know, conglomerates here. Basically, we had stream beds going along here. Uh, we also have seen mudstones. We've detected clays. Again, all of this stuff is telling us there had to have been fluid here, you know, and, uh, you know, based on the composition, it definitely was water. <laughs> 
And uh, this is a view not too long ago, a few months ago, from Curiosity looking up at this big mound in the center called Mount Sharp. And look at all those beautiful layers. I know Chris has spent time in northern Arizona. Doesn't that remind you of Painted Desert? <laughs> you know? It just it looks so familiar to those of us who live in the desert southwest. Uh, we see things like this all over the place. Uh, right now, Spirit ha or excuse me, Curiosity has moved past this little dark area here, which is actually sand dunes, and it's now over here, and it's actually starting to make a climb up this central mountain. So stay tuned over the next few months. Hopefully we're going to be seeing some really interesting results coming out from the analysis of these rocks. Okay, so to kind of summarize where we're at right now, we have really strong evidence from Opportunity that there was a saltwater sea in the area where it landed. Uh, at Gusev Crater with Spirit, evidence wasn't quite as strong initially, but yes, it turns out that Columbia Hills is actually full of sediments as well. Curiosity already is showing us that yes, there was a lot of liquid water uh, early in Martian history. And so when we combine all of this evidence from the rovers that we have on the surface together with our orbiting spacecraft that show us the rest of the geology of the planet, tell us something about the atmosphere. The atmosphere is thin today, but there's evidence that it must have been thicker in the past, coming out of one of our missions called MAVEN. And then also the me meteorite evidence, uh, all of this is telling us, yeah, there was actually a lot of water early on, the Mar early on in the Martian history. And in fact, in the 1990s, we had some scientists who said, it wasn't just early in Martian history, maybe we had something much more recently too. Maybe something within the last, oh, few hundred million years or last billion years. Which again, I know if you're not a geologist, those sound like really long time periods. I often have my students ask me, when did a, a million years end up not being a long time period to you? And it's like, well, when you take enough geology classes, it just kind of sinks in after a while. But again, you know, when you consider that Mars is four and a half billion years old, the age of the solar system, and the water that we've been looking at thus far has been about uh, three and a half to four billion years old, having something that's a billion years old or a few hundred million years old, that's recent. <laughs> And this is during a time period when we thought that the Martian atmosphere had already thinned and we basically had climatic conditions like we have today. But in the 1990s, we started to see a lot of evidence that there may have actually been a lot of liquid water in the northern plains, um, probably a big ocean of some sort. And again, this is something that would have been geologically recent compared to that earlier time period that we're seeing all the uh, evidence from the rovers for. Uh, we also do know that the northern plains are much lower than the southern highlands, so yeah, we do see channels that are flowing out and uh, you know, dumping their load out here in the northern plains, so if there is water in those channels, yeah, it could have gone ahead and, and produced water out in the northern plains. And then the other thing we know is uh, something to do with the actual roughness of the surface. Uh, this is a roughness map of Mars. And the lighter colors are rougher, the smoother colors are, uh, or the darker colors are smoother. And again, you can see that the northern hemisphere is much, much smoother than the southern hemisphere. When we compare with places on the Earth, trying to figure out, okay, what kind of environment can produce a surface that is that smooth that we see on Mars, the only place that we see something comparable is on the ocean floors where you've had the sediments being deposited in that ocean environment. So all of this was actually put forth as an argument that we may have actually had big oceans on the surface of Mars in relatively recent times. But again, this is during the time period when we would expect that the atmosphere had already thinned. So how can we have that much liquid water surviving on the surface of Mars under the current climatic conditions? Well, it turns out that even though Mars you know, went through a major period of climate change, probably about three and a half billion years ago, turns out it can go through kind of moderate stages of climate change even today. And this is actually due to the influence of Jupiter. Jupiter, of course, is a huge planet. It is 11 times the size of the Earth, very, very massive, has a lot of gravity. And Mars lies between Earth and Jupiter. So out where Mars is, it actually feels a little bit more of Jupiter's gravity over time than Earth does, although we feel some of it too. And what Jupiter's gravity actually does is it affects the 
orbit of Mars and also the amount of tilt of its rotation axis. So this, these are some diagrams that actually show as a function of time how things like the um, ellipticity of the orbit, what we call the eccentricity, how much the uh, you know, tilt of the orbit, how those have changed over time because of Jupiter's gravity. But we also have the tilt of the rotation axis. Anybody know what the tilt of the Earth's rotation axis is? It's about 23 and a half degrees, exactly. And that causes what? Seasons. Seasons. So it turns out that today, Mars also has a tilt, and it's about 25 degrees. So pretty similar to what the Earth's uh, tilt is. And so Mars does experience four seasons just like the Earth. Spring, summer, fall, and winter. They're about twice as long on Mars, because Mars' year is about twice as long as the Earth. But we do have those four seasons. But it turns out that because of this gravitational influence from Jupiter, that tilt actually ranges quite considerably. As little as 15 degrees, so the rotation axis is almost perpendicular, all the way to about 80 degrees, where the poles are basically pointing towards the sun. And now there's a lot of ice at the polar regions. I showed you that before. It's in the form of water ice, and it's also carbon dioxide ice. You point the poles towards the sun, they're going to get more sunlight, right? They're going to warm up. Guess what happens to all that ice? vaporizes into the atmosphere, and all of a sudden you've got a much thicker atmosphere. The other thing is both carbon dioxide and water are really good greenhouse gases. They like to warm up the surface, so they'll trap the heat next to the surface. So uh, we could go ahead and actually get a warmer surface, and a lot of people have argued, you know, we could go ahead and have rainfall, we could have liquid water on the surface, got a thicker atmosphere for a few million years, could go ahead and get these types of situations. And then the atmospheric scientists come and, you know, stamp on our dreams. Uh, <laughs> all their atmospheric models suggest that, you know, even with the poles pointed, you know, 80 degrees, the tilt being 80 degrees, poles pointed towards the sun, it's still not going to get warm enough for us to actually have liquid water and oceans anywhere. But it will actually cause snow. And we can go ahead and actually get glaciers. And guess what? We see features like this guy that it turns out this is actually dust-covered ice on the edge of an impact crater that is flowing down and into this material which is flowing down into the center of the crater. And this actually is kind of support, supported by the mineralogy because it turns out that in a lot of these places we have minerals like olivine, which it turns out olivine breaks down really fast in the presence of liquid water. So the mineralogy also suggests that it's probably mainly snow that we're actually dealing with here. Uh, so right now, there's actually a big debate in the community going on. There are those of us who do believe that ancient Mars is very wet. We like the geologic evidence. We see the mineralogical evidence, uh, the rovers, you know, everything we think points to the fact that ancient Mars had a thicker atmosphere. It was very wet, and then it gradually became dry as we lost the atmosphere and uh, it became very thin. Others have argued that Mars has always been dry. <clears throat> Once in a while, things might change a little bit, and you get you know, wet episodes, and that's what gives rise to all the geologic activity that we saw. But mostly, it's been dry. And then some people actually think that Mars was really cold early on, and all the water that was there was ice, and the entire planet was a big snowball. <laughs> So, like I said, this is an area of big debate right now. We, you know, I was just at a conference in Houston a couple weeks ago, our big spring conference, and everyone's going back and forth on this. Personally, like I said, I like this idea. I think the evidence is really strong that we had to have had a lot of liquid water, and it had to have been around for a long period of time on the surface of the planet, at least early on. So then, the, then that begs the question, well, where did all this water go if we had so much of it to begin with? Well, again, Mars is about half the size of the Earth, and that means that it has a lower gravity. Turns out that the gravity is about one-third of the gravitational pull here on the Earth. So it turns out some of that atmosphere is just naturally being lost to space. And again, we have this mission called MAVEN in orbit around Mars. It actually is measuring how rapidly the atmosphere is escaping to space. And when they extrapolate backwards, they find, yeah, there was a much thicker atmosphere in you know, the first billion years or so of Martian history, and that a lot of that atmosphere has simply escaped to space. 
Uh, but it turns out that we do think that a lot of the water that we had on the surface in the past is actually still there. It just infiltrated into the near surface region and it exists in the substrate. And uh, there is a possibility that we see some of it seeping out every so often. Uh, if you take a look at this image, you see these little white streaks here? Turns out these are areas that have changed in just a few years' time period. Those white streaks were not there previously. And this is all highly gully. This is, again, the edge of an impact crater. And you can see it's really gullied. And we have actually proposed that there may be groundwater seeping out to go ahead and give rise to these gullies. And it could be salt rich. And maybe that white stuff that you're seeing there is actually salt left over after the water has evaporated. Others have argued that this is just simply you know, avalanches caused by carbon dioxide, snow, and so forth. Again, a lot of debate, but there is some evidence that, yeah, there may actually be some liquid water involved here. Uh, probably the best evidence for liquid water on the surface of Mars today comes from these recurring slope lineae, RSLs. And these are dark, narrow lines that we see on the surface of the planet that change every so often. For example, here you can see one image, and here's the image of the same area. And OK, this guy is that guy, and this guy is down here. But lo and behold, hey, there's a new dark area. These guys come in the spring and last through the summer, and then they disappear in the fall and the winter. And they come back in the spring and the summer. And so the idea is that we've got some groundwater that when it gets warm enough, it can actually seep out you know, through the surface and create these dark streaks. And then in the fall and the winter, when it gets cold enough, that liquid water freezes, and we don't get these things actually forming. Again, we do have spectroscopic evidence here, and it turns out that it is consistent with this actually being briny liquids. So that would lower the, the freezing temperature as well and help make these things possible. Uh, we also have some evidence of where the water underground might actually be, especially the ice. And that comes from a gamma ray spectrometer that's on the Mars Odyssey mission in orbit around the planet. And the way that gamma ray spectrometers work, well, actually, this is neutrons uh, that we're looking at. Turns out that you get, have high energy particles coming in from space, what we call cosmic rays. They come from the sun, they come from our galaxy. And they can hit the surface. And when they do, they act, can actually knock uh, atoms off of the minerals in the surface. And it turns out that um, as you go ahead and you, you know, have these high energy particles coming in, they're knocking um, atoms off, but they're also knocking neutrons off of these atoms. And the neutrons can actually travel through the near surface region. Depending on the composition of the surface, those neutrons could get absorbed, or the neutrons can just pass right on through. Turns out that hydrogen really likes to absorb these neutrons. And in the inner solar system, hydrogen tends to be bound up with oxygen in the form of water. So when we look at a neutron map of Mars, we can translate that into a water abundance map. And that's what you're seeing here. The blue and purple areas are areas of high water concentration. And not a big surprise that the polar regions are pretty high in water. But what is interesting is that there are a few areas here in the equatorial region that seem to have high water concentrations. This is a surprise because these areas get enough sunlight, they should be warm enough that we wouldn't have any ice actually there. So there is some discussion that a lot of this could actually be hydrated minerals from the distant past that we're still picking up. Uh, we're picking up that water that's contained within the minerals. But interestingly, here, uh, Opportunity landed right about there and Spirit landed about there, and Curiosity is right about there. <laughs> All in these areas of high water concentration, and we have actually found from those rovers that yes, there is a lot of evidence that water was in those areas. But the issue here is that this neutron spectrometer can only see down to the upper meter, about a yard into the soil. And we'd like to know what's deeper. So that's where my research comes into play. Uh, I study these impact craters, and as I said, they create these nice holes in the ground. Uh, but what I really like about impact craters is that they can expose what is buried underneath. You go ahead and you have stuff tossed out, creating what we call an ejecta blanket. And on the moon, you get a very radial pattern here surrounding these craters. 
But here on Mars, it kind of looks like you took a rock and threw it into a mud puddle. It's a very fluidized type of ejecta blanket. And we believe that this is actually due to the fact that you're impacting into ice, a very ice-rich surface. You go ahead and vaporize some of that ice, you fluidize some of that ice, and you go ahead and actually create this fluidized pattern. So this is the only equations I'm going to show. Uh, as I mentioned, it is a case, we'll have a quiz at the end, um, <laughs> uh, that the depth of excavation, as I mentioned, is related to the actual size of the crater. It's about one-tenth. And so we can use that relationship, and then we have to do a little bit more magic because some craters are big enough, they've kind of collapsed a little bit. Uh, but basically, we can go ahead and use these relationships to figure out how deep the crater is actually excavating. And the ejected material, like that fluidized ejected uh, deposit that I just showed you, that actually only comes from about the top third of the crater depth. And so we can go ahead and do these types of calculations and figure out, okay, uh, what size range do we have for these different uh, you know, fluidized morphologies, uh, figure out the depths that they're excavating to and how deep down the uh, ejecta is coming from. And what we find is that this is a cross-section of uh, the planet, basically North Pole, Equator, South Pole, and this is where we think the ice actually is. So in this area where it's dark, ice is there all year round. Yeah, no, no two ways about it. Um, this area, if there's water present, it would always be in the form of ice. And then down here, it's actually warm enough from the heat on the inside of the planet that it would actually be liquid water. Turns out that some of our craters single layer and double layer are excavating into this area, and our multiple layer craters are actually excavating down to here. So we actually think that the appearance of the ejected deposit may actually be telling us something about whether or not we're excavating into ice versus actual liquid. And so we can go ahead and use that to start to get some idea in terms of where ice is, where liquid is, and again, as I said at the beginning, we want to send humans there someday, this gives us a way to actually start to estimate how deep down we'd have to drill to get to water resources that could support future colonies. Uh, we also do have some radar uh, on orbiting missions, and they can give us more direct information about where water might actually be. Uh, we do have two of these radars. Uh, one is called MARSIS on the European Space Agency's Mars Express mission, and then we have Sherard on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter mission, which is a NASA mission. Uh, Mars is sees down deeper. This is actually looking over the polar cap, and you can actually see a split in the signal here, which is telling you about the thickness of the polar cap. And this is all ice that we're actually dealing with here. Sherard doesn't see as deep, but it gives you a lot more detail. You can see lots of little layers here over the polar cap. And so again, we can start to get some idea in terms of how much ice might actually be there. And it's not just the polar regions. Uh, this is an area in the kind of just north of the equator uh, where we see a lot of those glacier-like deposits. And it turns out, yeah, Sherard is telling us these are ice rich as well from the last high tilt period. And then we did have a mission called Phoenix uh, that landed about 68 degrees north latitude several years back. Uh, this mission was actually run out of the University of Arizona, which is in Tucson, not Phoenix. You can imagine there is a lot of, uh, you know, nagging going on from their counterparts up in Phoenix. You know, you got this great mission and you called it after us. But no, it turned out that we actually had a mission in 2001 that went to Mars. And uh, unfortunately, it crashed before we could get any information from. Uh, this mission was the exact same design. But we made sure that we fixed all the problems, you know, so it wouldn't crash as well. So it was named Phoenix because it was like the Phoenix bird rising from the ashes. And uh, what it did was to land far enough north that uh, we looked out and we saw this kind of hilly terrain. Uh, turns out that's what we call polygonal terrain. It comes from freeze-thaw type cycles of ice. When we dug down into the near surface region, we saw this white stuff here. And we went, cool, that could be ice or it could be salt. We don't know. <laughs> so what do we do? We wait for a few days. Let the sunshine shine on it. And if it's ice, it's going to disappear. If it's salt, it won't. And after a few days, it disappeared. And we went, aha, it's ice. And we actually were able to scoop a little bit of it up and put it into instruments on board that tested the composition. Turns out it is water ice, pure water ice. <laughs> 
So we have actually tasted water ice on the surface of Mars now. And uh, we saw the same type of thing underneath the spacecraft. The rockets that slowed the spacecraft down as it was coming down actually blew away some of the dust, and you can see big chunks of ice down there too. So we do know that ice is up there near the polar regions, and another way is looking at new craters, craters that have just formed in the last few years. Uh, when they first form, a lot of times they actually have this little white deposit around them, and again, over the time span of a few weeks to months, that white spot disappears. So we are exposing ice. And so that allows us to get some idea in terms of what latitude range we can actually go down to and still have ice basically right at the surface of Mars. So again, these are all things that we're going to be interested in as we get to the point of saying, we want to send humans to Mars. Where is that ice that we can go to, pull it up, and actually melt it and drink it? So my message here is to stay tuned. We've got another mission going to Mars in 2020. Right now, given the inventive name of Mars 2020, I imagine we'll have a competition to get a good name for it at some point. But these are the final three landing sites that are being discussed right now. And over the next uh, year or so, they're going to zero in on one of these. Uh, Jezero Crater is actually one of these delta deposits. Again, this is color enhanced to kind of show different types of minerals. But again, it's got a lot of hydrated minerals. Um, a, you know, it certainly looks like an old delta deposit. Uh, Sirtis Major, again, has some mineralogy indicating that this was a very water-rich area at one time. And then lo and behold, the third landing site is Columbia Hills, back where Spirit had gone to. And again, the goal of Mars 2020 mission is to actually go ahead and look for evidence of ancient climate. But this mission is actually going to pick up soil and rock samples, store them on board. And then some future mission will actually go to that uh, rover, retrieve those samples, and bring them back to Earth for analysis. So at that point, we will finally be able to get these into our terrestrial labs and really analyze them and hope to get much better information about the timing of the water as well as how much water was probably there. So in summary, hopefully by now I've convinced you there's lots of evidence that yes, even though Mars today is very cold and very dry, that it was a very water-rich planet in the past. Uh, that there's a lot of water there, it was in the liquid state early on, it's mainly in the ice state at this point, but lots and lots of evidence that yes, it was there. Um, maybe not, doesn't look like this recently, but this is an artist's concept of what one of these ancient lake beds probably looked like. But again, the combined geologic evidence, the spacecraft data, all of it points to a much better understanding of where the volatile reservoirs are today. And again, understanding this gives us some sense in terms of, uh, you know, investigating the issue of life, whether or not it's still there or was there in the past, uh, gives us information about the location of resources for future human settlements. And the other thing that I like to come back to when we look at Mars and we see that, you know, okay, it has to have gone through these periods of climate change. What this does is it helps us better understand what are some of the natural cycles that give rise to climate change? You know, how much climate change can you expect? And then we can compare that with what we see here on the Earth to get a better sense of how much human involvement is contributing to climate change here.